So, hello and welcome back. Um, I figured I'd sort of jump the gun a little bit. We dive straight into uh, a bit of elementary coding and, I, well, I guess not on the, the project notes, but um, specifically on talking about the neural networks. I was going to start recording uh, an episode on architectures and the differences between them and why we're going to be using a compositional approach and why I was thinking of um, tying that into Blender in order to get visualization from our models. Uh, and from the training. And then I realized, well, one thing that sort of should preface all of our, our architectures in the abstract world should be a little bit of rundown on the hardware that not just that I'm going to be using, but also the reason for the necessity of optimizations as far as training and implementing neural networks go to begin with. Because fundamentally, the... Uh, the hardware architecture is our bottleneck here, and that's the reason for the, necessi uh, the necessity to optimize our algorithms. So, I should have started with a PC architecture video, so that's what this one is. I'm just going to quickly cover some of those basics, so at least we're all on the same page and we know what we're talking about when we reference like memory versus storage, um, PCI bandwidth, uh, CPU cores, GPU, all that kind of stuff. Okay, you've no doubt heard before that computers op operate by manipulating ones and zeros to perform their tasks. So from basic algorithmic and counting to like logic and computers basically are just turning switches on and off, which is the transi transistor. So when, when you've got one gate, well, I'll show you here. <clears throat> A transistor essentially just works like this. And this is your output. Oop. Sorry, I'm just still getting used to these pens. This is your output. So it's basically a question, right? And if this is yes or no. And that just basic straight up just means that like if there's a signal coming in through here, then this is yes. And if there's no signal coming in through here, then it's no, right? So with a gate like this, um, you could basically just cut this whole section off, right? And then say, is there a line yes or no? Like, because any, anything feeding into the output, if it's blank, that's a zero. And a zero is basically the same thing as false. So yes is the same thing as true, obviously. And this is the same thing as false. So all computers work on transistor logic, binary logic, Boolean logic for uh, other terms. And Boolean was, or Bool, I don't know what his name was, but <laughs> uh, he, he was the guy who wrote the paper on doing math in strict base two, which is just zero or one. Those are the only two options that you have. So in order to count, um, this would be zero. The next number up would be one. To do two, just like how you go from in a base 10 system where you go from 10 to 20 to 30, and then when you get to 100, you just add uh, add digits. So like 9, 9, 9, when you add 1, you go to 1,000. So this here is denoting the transition between all three of these and its uh, increments of 10. Um, with binary though, you, you've only got the one and the zero to work with, so every position under here is uh, uh, steps up in base two, and that's why computers operate with memory and stuff of um, you know 256 or 8 bit or 32 bit. They're all powers of two. Uh, the reason for this is because two is the base of the the counting system, the the uh, the architecture fundamentally underneath the the, the technology that we're using to process our logic and do our arithmetic and all that. So the neat thing with binary logic, though, is that it, it operates as conditionals and you can chain them together 
and create more complex sequences. So if you wanted to have an AND, you could just have two of these, right? And we'll get into logic gates actually after. But if I say this is yes, and then I set another gate up here to check this is yes, that's basically saying this and this equals true. If this one's true, um, let me go down here. If this one's true, but this one's false, let me just scribble that out. It's basically like saying, is this and this true? In this case, no, it's not. This and this are, this one's true, this one's false. So the output then becomes false and you can start doing like proper logic, like English logic. And that's all programming is, is you're checking transistors to say whether or not they're on or off or whatever. So hopefully that makes a bit of sense, but we're not going to get too much into binary logic, but I do want to show you the diagrams. Oops. Redo, control Y. Oops. There we go. I do want to show you the diagrams in uh, Logisim because it's going to help us plan out how to connect our models and things like that. But getting back to <clears throat> the hardware portion of this, um, computers are exceptionally fast, but they're not infinitely fast. And since machine learning requires hundreds of millions of simple operations to traverse a network, um, understanding the hardware running these operations will provide intuitions in how to generally design code to make the use of the system's resources as effectively as possible so we can get the most benefit from uh, or the most bang from our buck. So this is in, this is crucially important not only as like for workstation computers or desktop systems like the ones I'll be using to run my experiments but um, it's equally import important for high-performance computing applications running on mainframe supercomputers because AI networks tend to scale non-linearly as complexity grows. And that is, like I was saying before, that, that's our bottleneck. Because the more complex and the, the bigger and grandiose our, our systems are, like we can just keep adding parameters to, to our heart's content. But with every one parameter we add, we get a multiplicative, not a linear scale of the complexity of processing power required. And that's sort of where optimizations become critical. And there, there are a ton of different ways of uh, implementing those op uh, optimizations, and some of them are related directly to the model architecture, some are related directly to the programming, like the language and the libraries that we use, and other optimizations are based on the hardware. So to start off, before we get into optimizations of code, software, and libraries, and, and architectures like graph neural networks, and uh, adversarial networks, encoders, transformers, and all that kind of jazz, um, first we should get into how the computer actually processes on the hardware you have. So if you're looking to build a computer or buy one, you know what types of specs to look like because it's not just a matter of more numbers, more better. It's really dependent on the use case and the scenario that you want to use it for. And machine learning has a very particular and specific use case. So there are very specific requirements and guidelines and to better assess um, which trade-offs to make and how, how to optimize your, your econo economize your, your spending for your research projects if you're doing this at home or whatever. Um, the best thing to do is to understand the hardware behind it so you know which pieces and which components are going to start giving or when they're going to start giving you diminishing returns um, with the more money you spend and yada yada. So if, if our goal was to figure out how to write a mathematical model to help us uh, perfect a game of tic-tac-toe, for instance, uh, the easiest approach would just be to map all possible games and then assign the win-loss tie probabilities to each move as the options are presented to us. And you can see how that would be a ton of games. Um, you can estimate the complexity by some dirty back of the napkin math, but the game works on a three by three grid of just X's and O's. So the game is inherently binary and it applies to a three by three matrix. Uh, 
So there's nine possible starting points, in other words. Um, the starting point... Uh, yeah, you get nine options on the starting point, but then every time one of the players or one of the turns occurs, um, one of the options is being removed from the table until the game is over, right? So uh, not all games are going to need all nine moves. You can win before then, so it's you know, that's why I say it's some dirty math back of the napkin or whatever to just calculate it out as a factorial problem. But if you did that, you'd at least know the limit to the complexity, even if it's only an estimate. So it's still helpful to figure that kind of thing out. There are some moves, if you were to do, like in keeping with this example of the tic-tac-toe, there are some moves which almost never result in a win, but which do result in many losses and ties. So if we drafted a simple cost function that scores all outcomes of a move with a plus one for wins and a minus one for losses and a zero for ties, for example, we could simply add up all the possible scores of outcomes for each move, the com then compare those cost reward functions to decide what move is the best one to make in the next uh, in our next option to maximize our chances of winning the game. And you could do this basically just by running through every possible combination of all possible games, adding up all the scores for that move with that board layout, and then you'd know exactly what the best option was. Um, so that's sort of what we're doing with machine learning. It's not that the computers are actually learning anything or that we're, we're rewiring any of the circuitry in, in the boards to, to have some type of consciousness or anything. It's just a statistical probability mapping. And then we're telling it through code to spit back out the highest probability mapping that we get from the results, given the inputs that we give it, given the training data that we've given it, given the rule set and the cost reward functions that we've provided in, in its instantiation. So using this approach is kind of simple and easy enough to, for any computer or smartphone to brute force through. So there's no real need to optimize that type of, uh, that type of a problem in a tic-tac-toe example, because a three by three grid isn't anything too complex. But if you know anything about exponentiation, as soon as you start adding one more row and column, you develop very quickly um, the number of possible moves and possible games becomes intractable. It becomes impossible to brute force through just by checking every everything. So um, that's sort of the point of the optimizations, though. Um, if you wanted to calculate even with the tic-tac-toe example, as I mentioned, the factorial, that in case you're unfamiliar, I guess, like I said, we're going to be starting from the ground up. So the factorial is just, uh, you have nine options to begin with. After the first selection, you have eight options. Then after that selection, then you have seven options, et cetera, et cetera. So to get the number of possible games that you could get, um, not including, you know, ending a game early because of a win, but just the dirty math here, it would be nine nine options times eight options, because for every one of those nine, there are eight other options left afterwards. For every one of those eight options left afterwards, there's another seven, right? So each of those nine get an eight, get eight following moves and seven following moves, etc. So we multiply all of those potential options together to get the maximum total number of different games that could be played in the tic-tac-toe example. So the reason that the numbers are less, uh, as I said, is because there's no need to continue playing the game, though, if uh, if you get three O's in a row or three X's in a row. So the number is that we get from the output of the factorial is going to be higher than the actual number in real life for this game, given the rule set of this game. So if you were looking for possible ways to lay out a garden brick, then you wouldn't change the formula because every brick could be replaced with every other brick. So you'd just have a bunch of copies of layouts, but all of those copies of layouts would have different bricks in them because there's no way to just end the patio just because your brick is already laid, right? You still need to finish the rest of the patio. So it's very contingent on the outcome and the goal specified at the outset. So... But that's why we, uh, I, I sort of round up first, and then I find ways to chip away at the optimization, or in the optimization process, I find ways to chip away at that complexity or to whittle it down to as small as possible. And as I said, you can do that through hardware acceleration. Um, sometimes you can do it through drivers. 
Sometimes you can do it through code, just the way that you've structured the algorithm written through like uh, iterating through arrays. A lot of times that you don't need to finish a loop once you've already found your match. Or if you're running a filter on an array, um, maybe it would be more efficient to have them grouped as that array is being built into a separate array and then just running through that secondary array be that which is already filtered so that uh, if you're if you're iterating through an array once already and you can kind of piggyback on that iteration to do a next step that you're going to do later on uh, it's way more efficient to run through it once and do two operations as you're going through each element of the array than it is to go through the entire array and then later on when you actually need to, to filter your list, iterate through the entire array again. So that's an example of a, a simple optimization strictly through code. An example of an optimization strictly through hardware would be processing tensor multiplications like these matrices, the three by three grid that we're talking about, and all of our potential outcomes. Processing those through a GPU concurrently as opposed to doing it linearly on, on a single thread sequentially from start to finish, checking one example after the other. Um, doing them all simultaneously because a separate game has no effect on the current game, you can run them in parallel and process a whole bunch of outputs and then have the results just sitting there waiting for your CPU to catch up and, and grab all the results and then tally them together. So that would be an example of hardware acceleration and optimizations through hardware. Um, <clears throat> it's sort of an important example too because in cases where we really don't need to concern ourselves with optimization problems, uh, we really shouldn't waste our time on it. The reason being is that engineering an algorithm is mentally labor intensive and testing systems is mostly efficiently done if they're simple enough uh, that they're wasting computational resources in the process but not human resources. This may seem counterintuitive at first, but if you consider adding complexity of optimizing a single, a simple game when, it benef when the benefits of doing so amount to less than a few seconds of compute time during training, and no additional overhead as far as like you know minimal amount of power and things like that then there, there's really there's really no there's a high cost to to the energy involved in the input of figuring things out but there's a, a low productivity value from the output of that and that's sort of why optimizing th optimizing our algorithms aren't necessarily always in the best interest of our finished product sometimes you might just want to do a quick brute force because it doesn't actually slow down anything else if you're already waiting on something else to, to finish computing and you're running all of these algorithms in parallel anyway. Like why put hours into finicking through the code so that you can, you know, move a whole bunch of quick variables into registers and memory as opposed to just reading them directly off an SSD and running a quick, uh, uh, a quick process or comparison or conditional or whatever. Um, off the SSD instead of off of memory or cache or something. So it really, it matters how we optimize our time too. And I guess that's the more abstract version of optimization is knowing when to, to even bother <laughs> essentially. But one might think that uh, carrying a model like this might be bulkier than necessary. And in a few edge cases that may be accurate, but more often than not, the complexity of refining a model to overly optimized to be overly optimized it just it adds so many lines of code or it reduces the readability of the code and especially in the case of recursion if you've seen my other video on primitive recursion and it provides so little benefit in many cases that the code itself winds up taking uh, more resources than the actual wasteful data aggregated by the quick and dirty brute force method that only, you know, would be work of a, a few minutes to cobble together and in the end doesn't actually affect the output or the outcome of our artificially intelligent model, supposedly, with air quotes. So I guess the point of estimating the complexity in the way that I'm doing it is on the high side is to, um, it's just to do a quick check for ourselves whether or not there's any point or reason or benefit to the optimizations. So it's kind of like getting a, it's a, it's a litmus test for how much energy or effort we should put into the refinement of um, this and the sophistication or the eloquence of our, the code that we're putting together or the dynamic structures of the neural network architectures that we're com compositing. 
Uh, if, if there's really no need for that much complexity or so much specificity in a floating point weight that we're applying to a layer of our neural network, then all of that effort isn't just wasting one row of, uh, of compute power. It's actually it's multiplying the complexity of the entire rest of the network because of exponentiation. And the main point to this is to say, a small little oversight or um, or error in judgment in this type of regard can lead to an intractable model becoming tractable, and that's crucial because with a with a simple um, with a simple little issue like the way we iterate through an array could make it cost thousands of dollars potentially if you're running these on supercomputers whereas you could run the prototype on your home computer if you realized or caught the optimization error right from the beginning so it actually makes a huge difference when you're dealing with a binary system and a multi-dimensionally complex you know array of matrix operations so all, all of this preambulation is merely to emphasize the importance of knowing how the computer works at a hardware level, even if only cursory awareness, just so that we can adequately assess the validity of our propositions and gauge our approach with, res with respect for the compute power and computational resources required to accomplish our end, our end goals. So it'll help us not just spot bottlenecks and stuff ahead, but it also helps us find bugs and flaws in the math, and even sometimes provides general clues to clever approaches to fix the problems or address the problems that we do have facing us moving forward. So there's also a conceptual reason to do this type of just quick and dirty back of the mat napkin math to analyze our, our computational requirements just on a really superficially easy level, um, like doing the factorial for the tic-tac-toe game, even though we know that there's going to be less than nine factorial possible games because the game can end sooner than the whole grid is filled up. But doing that type of thing bef uh, from the onset gives you a general idea before you get started how much effort to put into the optimization process because it may or may not even be worthwhile. Uh, it may not even be possible if you think about it. And if, if you needed like 10 to the 82 uh, computer cores to get this thing running in a month, then you know like that's physically impossible and you got to approach it from a different way or find a, you know, scale down the, the maps, the, the weight maps and stuff that you're using. So with hardware, I'm going to start off at the uh, CPU and I'm just going to take this off of Newegg here. Um, it's... I just got it from Google here, and I believe that I don't have to worry about copyright since I'm commenting on something that's published by somebody else. Uh, we'll figure it out. <laughs> but essentially, I'm just going to go through some of these, but I can't see them very well, so I'm going to copy the picture over to here and paste. See if I can scale this up a bit. Ooh. Reset. Lock. There we go. And this way I can just kind of draw all over it and stuff. It'll be easier. To new layer. Put you below. Okay. So this is where our CPU goes. Paintbrush. Pencil. I think I want the paintbrush. <clears throat> and I probably want to pick a different color. Let's do... Sure. There you go. Okay, so this is our CPU socket. And there are several different types of CPUs, but... Um, well, I'll just I'll, I'll just get into the the long and short of it first. So, starting with the central processing unit, um, this is the main chip in our computers, and it does all of the programmable processing and the logic and the interconnects between the components and and peripherals that are all plugged into the motherboard. Oh, I guess that's where I should have started. Eh? This whole thing is a motherboard, by the way. 
this whole thing. And it's obviously called that because all of these slots are female and they take male slots. So this is a RAM slot, the RAM stick slides in, this is a PCI slot, the PCI stick slides in, etc, etc. Uh, so that's the motherboard. The motherboard connects all of our hardware components and the reason for this is uh, it's basically a modular design. It's the same thing that we're going to be doing with our modular approach to um, building neural networks together is using one type of network for one type of processing and another type of network for another type of processing. In the brain we'll call it like sensory processing and in neural networks it could be anything from uh, generative models that take instances from what they've already gathered through the training data and then produce something similar just based on an algorithm like um, blur would be a, a similar algorithm where when you blur something you're taking the pixel value and then you're if it's a high pixel value like it's a dark black so it's one or zero if it's blank and if it's dark black you could say every pixel around it checks all the pixels around them and then they average out the number of all the blocks around them and basically you wind up with uh, a blurry a blurry blob because you're taking a finite set of pixels that are well defined and have uh, structured edges and everything and you're you're grabbing the defi the well defined edge the sharpened edge and you're stretching it out in all directions um, equip or relative to the amount of blocks that are present in the pixel from the center. Uh, so the out the output of that is, well, I guess I could just show you. We could just do a Gaussian blur on here. And you see everything kind of, well, maybe you can't see it. I'll repeat it a couple times. Blur, blur. Blur. So all it's doing is taking one of these pixels here, and then if that pixel value is like 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, then the one next to it will just be 0 0.5. But if you have, if this pixel is really dark and this one's really light, then when this pixel checks the ones all around it, it'll say 1, 1, maybe 0.75, 0.25, 0, 0, 0, and then it'll set itself as the average of all the pixels around it. And the average, again, is just if you've got, what, 3, 3, 4, 5. If you've got 5 pixels around it, you just add them all up, divide by 5, and then say my pixel value equals um, the difference between myself, whatever my current value is at, and 5. and Or, sorry, and the sum of all the others divided by 5. And we'll get into that when we do the maths too, because that's that's literally how the algorithms are written mathematically in in that Greek notation. Um, we're just summing over all of our examples. Uh, we're taking a half of that, and then we're adding or taking the difference of to get our our uh, our linear regression. I'm working on video series actually for the linear regression and gradient descent. But um, finding a slope that meets that matches all of the other points that are in the matrix that's being applied to it, and then finding the best fit line to to get closest to all of them, and then you from that line you just take the square difference, the mean squared usually, um, and that's how you produce a cost function. But anyway, so with the motherboard, the CPU processes all of our logic and things like that, and although it's a super handy it's a super handy device and piece of hardware to have because it can run anything that you throw at it. Like that's how your operating system works. That's how your components uh, interact with and take instructions from and perform operations. It's all through the central processing unit. And so it's real. it's, it's not to diminish the CPU's value in machine learning because it's not accelerated specific to machine learning tasks. It's necessary to sort of orchestrate everything else kind of like a choir, right? Uh, just because you have an alto and a tenor and, um, you know, a bass, uh, what do you call it, uh, soprano, just because you have them individually doesn't mean that they don't work better collectively, right? But if you have a really good soprano, you can also get them to do solos, for example. So... With CPUs then, um, 
a lot of what you'll find in marketing material and stuff, if we go back out to here, CPU. Well, I guess I can go to any one of these, but I'm not a fan of Intel, but I've got an Intel board, so whatever. So if you go into here, they'll tell you right here, ah, they'll tell you right here when they're selling you the clock speed in Hertz. So uh, Hertz is just number of cycles per second. The boost clock. So as long as the temperatures aren't exceeding a certain threshold, then the CPU will allow itself to run faster. It tells you the core count and the thread count. And this is really, really important for machine learning because this is going to help us with our parallelism a lot. So when you're running operations that don't require sequential processing, like really, really quick sequential processing, like if you're trying to do batch processing, like we're going to be doing with, you know, parallelism and concurrency and things like that, <clears throat> it's more important to have a high core count than a clock count because most of the time spent when processing these types of operations is going to be not in the actual logic it's going to be in the um it's going to be in the number of times it has to iterate through that logic and the more cores you have the more times you can run through it so having more threads is even better um but threads are based on cores but uh thread counts are just the core count but it's it's doing two th it's operating on two threads on one core which is why they're usually not always now because they got a big little designs in their chip architectures but that's probably getting too deep into the reads um <clears throat> what you need to know is that just because a computer has eight cores it might only have eight threads but those eight threads will likely be a lot faster in sequential processing than a 16 threaded eight core processor but for machine learning or for uh, ray trace rendering or anything that's to do with concurrency and matrix multiplications, more threads is generally going to be more helpful, but not always. If you're going to get a clock speed that outpaces a uh, higher thread counted CPU, chances are that you're paying a lot more for those clocks than you would have been paying just for the extra cores. And that's sort of where uh, this type of information comes in handy because knowing the difference between your use cases will dra dramatically change the cost of the project moving forward, um, which is obviously huge. <clears throat> so, um, the cores, they are self-contained in the CPU with their own logic and counting units so that they can process instructions on their own if another core is busy. And that's kind of what makes them fast, even if they have lower, lower core counts, is that concurrency, like I was saying. So they can technically only do one thing at a time, but the way the signals are processed on, on peaks and troughs, if you only ran operations on the peaks, that, that would be equivalent to running on one thread and only ran other operations on, on the troughs, that would be equivalent to the other thread. Because generally, if you send uh, a task over like a get request, like I need this information from RAM, the CPU has got to sit there for clock cycles waiting for that information to come back. In the meantime, it can start processing stuff on those downstrokes, right? And that's generally the benefit to higher thread counts when you're running a big training model is because in the training model, you're dumping a batch of instructions and you're just waiting for it to finish all these instructions. And each one of those instructions is processing matrix multiplications that are pulled from your RAM and your hard drives. And most of that time is spent waiting for responses from like an algorithmic unit or something, or an increment counter or an accumulator or a multiplication operation or something like that. So your CPU is not entirely active the entire time, but if you have more cores or more threads, you can make it so. Uh, having a, a faster clock speed just means that you'll be waiting for more cycles, but you'll have more cycles to, to waste, uh, basically. The benefit to having a higher clock speed and higher core count together, despite you know the cost for it, is that you can you can run more complex operations in a single line of instructions, and that that might be getting a bit 
too far into it, but if you see these giant supercomputer uh, HPC, high performance computing um, cloud servers and things like that, they'll generally run huge instructions, like multiple instructions within a single instruction and wrap them all together and dump that off to the CPU. And those uh, those processing units are extremely efficient and can do a ton more work, but usually their clock speeds are down at like 2 gigahertz instead of 4 or 5 for that very reason, is because they can do a bunch of operations within a single line of instructions as opposed to doing a whole bunch of short instructions, um, but faster. So th there's give and take, obviously, to all of them, but that's the difference between the types of CPU ar architectures, too. So a AMD and uh, Intel are the two big players in desktop computers and the server space for the most part right now. And for things that are low-powered devices that uh, like laptops, um, uh, tablets, phones, uh, e even desktop computers now are starting to move towards uh, ARM, which is another instruction set. And the premise or philosophy be behind that instruction set is just that it uses a smaller number of primitive instructions. It doesn't base itself off the uh, x86 ISA. It has, uh, which is an Intel patented ISA that's restricted, which is a whole another pet peeve of mine, but we won't get into that. I'm sure I ranted about it enough in our project video, the introduction. But um, yeah, so a ARM is ARM processors are excellent for uh, parallel computing, not just because of their power efficiency. That means you can throw a whole bunch more cores into the same area without producing as much heat. And heat is the, the bane of the existence of a CPU because it has to slow down if it starts overheating so it doesn't break itself. So even though you've got a slower ARM processor, it, if it's running at lower power, first of all, saves money and, and resources. Um, including the expense of having power supplies and, and uh, voltage regulators and things like that that have to manage that consistent stable power that the, the processors need to do their jobs. But in addition to that, you can pack more cores into it and run them more consistently and keep them busy more often with those shorter instructions. But it, it's not going to be as quick uh, in the sense that you won't get as many operations done in one cycle as you will from an x86 architecture, which has more um, more complex instructions to use. Uh, but at the same time, you can run more of them at the same time. So that that's that give and take. And, and generally speaking, you don't need the most powerful, fastest anything. What you want to find is the thing that will get you the most benefit for your application, for the thing that you're going to do with it, whether that's uh, you need a long battery life and not much processing power, and then you pick ARM, or if you want an ARM server that has thousands and thousands of cores and you don't want to be running a, uh, a, a freezer unit to keep the thing cool enough that it keeps running at the same pace, you know, um, not to mention the environmental and, you know, for the electricity extraction and all that. But um, the way CPUs connect to all their other peripherals out here, I should just keep moving on, is through uh, PCI lanes and peripheral component interconnect is the slots. I'm not sure if they keep using the same acronym for the lanes, but basically you've got dedicated data, data lines, transmission lines that come from the CPU here to, um, oh, changed my color again. Uh, okay. Okay. So you've got dedicated lines that come to the, to your RAM slots, and I'll get into RAM and memory in a minute. Uh, these are your VRMs here. That's your voltage regulators and stuff. Uh, you've got PCI lanes that go to these components here, and you've got PCI lanes coming from the CPU going to the chipset down here. And your chipset, this thing here, covers all of these and these. Uh, generally, it'll be all of these components too. So USB, anything that you want to plug in, that'll usually come off the chipset. So this will be for your GPU here. So generally speaking, new newer models have, um, well, I'll just put that in, GPU. Newer models will have direct PCI lanes, usually an X16. 
uh, dedicated for just this one slot, and then these slots here will share the remaining um, four or six channels or whatever whatever's left over from uh, from that. Most CPUs have also like inter or not most. A lot of CPUs now have integrated graphics, which is an IGP or a G uh, APU, depending on which company. It's the same thing, but it's an integrated graphics port, IGP or uh, uh, APU. Well, it's I don't know. It's an onboard, so built into the CPU, they've got a little section of the CPU, like kind of reserved for for graphics, and it's not necessarily for like games and things like that. But it's um, graphics are done by screen matrices, which are matrix operate operations to determine pixel values to display on an output. Um, you can do that just on a CPU, even without an APU plugged in, but it's extremely inefficient and it's very slow and laggy. So to help with um, Let's say if you're having trouble with the GPU you've plugged in and you've got no display out, it's almost impossible to troubleshoot it without putting it without having a second GPU to plug in and check it, right? So a lot of CPUs just have really weak um, uh, GPUs built into them just so that there's something to display an output to and also like troubleshoot problems or just set up a server and stuff if you don't need it for for anything graphically intensive like watching movies or rendering video or something like that. So uh, CPUs are very complex and because of that they're extremely useful in many many cases like they're multi-purpose but they're not the most efficient way to run neural networks or process matrices. Uh, matrix operations generally require a lot of back and forth and accumulate operations, so you're using up a whole bunch of clock cycles on, on short instructions and storing those instructions. Whereas if you had a bunch of really simple cores that don't do anything but those types of operations, you don't even really need to tell them what to do, because as soon as they receive data, all they do is process and spit it out because that's the one thing they know how to do. Those cores can be really tiny, really cheap, really power efficient, and those types of accelerated hardware um, can be found in all kinds of different uh, hardware applications, anywhere from uh, FPGAs, and I'll get to those later, and, and GPU processors, and uh, even microcontrollers that handle data transmission between peripherals and uh, component interconnects and things like that. So... That's cores. Uh, the clock speeds, we kind of talked about a little bit, but uh, just, you know, a little bit more on clock speeds. Computers measure a clock speed is just a cycle per second. So the time it takes for an instruction to, to go into the CPU, figure out what it's going to do, like through all those transistor um, uh, conditionals, and then request information or request a write or tell something else in the computer what to do. That, that's, a, that's a cycle. Um, the cycles work on a frequency, which is just a waveform for the, for the electricity running through it. And again, that's probably a little bit uh, too in-depth. But clock speeds are generally today measured in gigahertz, which are like, what, I think billions of... Yeah, billions per second. Um, one hertz is one cycle per second. Uh, call. Um, yeah, I guess we can probably skip a bunch of this. Uh, I just had some notes here about the details, but I don't think any of that's going to be practical or applicable in our case because all of our, all of my code is going to be running off of uh, dedicated hardware. So CPU processing is mostly going to be for scheduling the dedicated hardware and the acceleration and rendering these videos, obviously, and recording and processing the audio afterwards, that kind of thing. So I am going to be using a lot of CPU power, but I don't, I, I won't be using anything that's like out of reach for the average mortal human to purchase. Uh, I think eight core, six, or eight core 16 thread CPUs, you can get uh, two or three years old now, or they're they're under three hundred dollars, so they're actually affordable. Whereas you know, t ten years ago it would have been <laughs> tens of thousands. So we've come a long way since then. So uh, yeah, that's that's cores and clocks and the CPUs, very very important. But as I said, most of our libraries will be 
doing all the scheduling and uh, and applying them the way we want them applied on its own, which is nice because that type of low level hardware programming and control would make this type of work absolutely physically impossible. So um, other than that, and, uh, and well, and I should give you another example where clock speeds do matter. Actually, performing like single computation where the next operation relies on the one before it, like I was talking about the sequential uh, operations. A good example for this is like long division. Um, if you're trying to do long division, like here, I'll do it on here. Everybody's kind of familiar with long division, right? So like uh, if I did 325, oops, well, not square root, just division, force of habit, uh, divided by three. You can't really start over here. You have to start at how many threes are there in the three? One. How many threes are there in two? Zero. How many threes are there in 25? Um, what, seven? Yeah, seven. So seven, 21, that comes to four. Anyway, you can't really start the next step until you know what your remainder is from the one before. That's sort of what I was getting at. And that's kind of like how the, uh, the difference between a sequential process on a clock speed that runs really quick and a parallel process where if you could, ah, I keep doing the root thing. If you could imagine having a really big number or whatever, right? If you had a really big number like this and you could take this number and do all of these simultaneously, if you could, which you can't in long division, but if you could, and then just combining the results afterwards, like A, B, C, and then having your result down here. If you could do that, that would be uh, an example of con concurrency. And this process here of scheduling would be the part done by the CPU. And then these parts here would be the parts done by like an FPGA or a GPU, uh, etc. Like a dedicated hardware accelerator would have all of these little cores doing the processing in tandem, and you'd use a CPU, like the multi um, the multi purpose processor, to send the information from here into the FPGA so that you could get your result. And then your CPU would then take your result and process these together and then do whatever you want from that afterwards. That, that's sort of how the CPU works with the, the concurrent cores or tensor cores or whatever other types of uh, uh, hardware that you're using. So they actually work together. It's not that one thing is better or worse than the other or that one's necessary and the other's not. You actually do want both. It's just a matter of how much of each that you actually need. And that's going to depend entirely on the types of models and architectures that you're going to be running, not necessarily on, uh, not necessarily on the project at hand, but the, the way the project is being implemented or the type of network that's being implemented is going to matter more not always, but oftentimes it's going to matter more the uh, the number of cores and the hardware accelerators that you have is going to be more important than whether you have the next generation $700 CPU versus the last generation $300 GPU uh, or a CPU. You're, generally speaking, for the extra $400 you'd be spending on the brand new hardware, you're not getting any performance uplift uh, that you wouldn't get from having a hardware accelerator that's only worth, you know, a hundred bucks, like a, an ASIC or something like that, which is hardware developed that's not even programmable. It just does its one specific task, like a Bitcoin mining ASIC. They're highly power efficient because they don't have any optionality or, or customization available, but at that same token, they can't really do anything else. So I, I guess that kind of leads me into the next section, which is like uh, ALU and FPU, which is like part of the CPU. 
uh, to perform its logic, it needs an algorithmic logic unit um, or the floating point units or another little section. So when you've got, uh, I guess I, yeah, I don't need this. So if you've got a, a CPU, I should change this color a little bit too, yeah, whatever, black. Okay. Oh. So this is my CPU. And if I blow that up so I can see it a little bit better, to something like this. What the hell? It's changed the size on me. Fifteen. Yeah, that'll work. Okay, so if I blow it up, you might have your uh, the IGP in here. That's that integrated graphics processor. You might have an ALU in here, which is just like a little logic unit. Uh, it might have FP32. Whoa. FP32 which is a floating point processing unit, and that's a specific unit to get decimal points out of binary is actually pretty complicated when you think about it because uh, the way to do it most efficiently is actually not the easiest way to rationalize. It requires the... Um, so like if you have a 16-bit number, you get 15 bits or something of that. One is the sign, so the negative sign is either a 1 or a 0. So that leaves you with 15 other bits, and then I think you get two or four of those bits are going to be a mantissa and that's based on the remaining bits the maximum value divide it find the remainder blah 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 anyway figure out decimal points in uh in binary is exceedingly complicated but not beyond the realm of comprehension it's just not something we really need to uh to go over because it's not important but um that's an fp32 unit uh, there are all kinds of different little sort of embedded processors within the CPU is what I'm getting at. So the CPU isn't just like one thing that does everything. It's a collection of all these other little types of units that you need for um, like power management and scheduling and oh you got your clock in there somewhere too. So you've got a, uh, a timer, right? Otherwise it wouldn't know when uh, or how how to how to speed itself up, slow itself down, or when to wait, uh, how long it's been waiting. It won't know when it's frozen, and yada yada yada. So, all of these types of um, these types of small chip built into the CPUs are necessary for the CPU to be able to perform this variety of tasks. And the most efficient way to build these things is to have integrated. Um, modules from within these CPUs and different companies will have different architectures or structures. This is what they mean by the architectures, obviously. But GPUs also have the same thing. Like GPU architectures will be structured uh, differently but similarly. You'll have like uh, MCMs and GCDs and these will have like their own little um, like memory transports that they manage, and then you'll have a bunch of these in uh, concurrency too, right? So you might have something like this, <clears throat> where everything's sort of bunched out in a hierarchy, and then you've got a main uh, a main monolithic die maybe up here that sort of regulates everything. I'll just call it the regulator. But again, the specific terms aren't necessarily important, but what's, what is 
or the specifics of the diagrams, obviously. But what is important is to understand that it, it's not just um, it's not just a block of one thing doing everything on its own, the way we think of a brain that just controls the entire body. It's more like the brain having its sections that control parts of the entire body, right? So the the visual cortex handling most of your optical sensory perception and your amygdala handling a bunch of your your animalistic responses in your lizard brain and all that it's like having dedicated focus groups of processing that then wire together from uh, a, a sort of master controller at the top who says okay well, this sensory input thanks thanks for letting me know eyes but i i don't need that visual sensory input right now anyway because we're trying to sleep i need this other one from this hormone that's going to help me fall asleep and you know things like that you've got a little master puppeteer at the top that handles all of these subcomponents given the task at hand uh ob obviously if you're if you're in the if you're looking for food or something because you're, you're starving, you're going to not be as keen to sleep as you are to run and chase uh, an animal or uh, salivate or digestion or something. Your digestive system's not going to just be like, mm, I'm too tired to digest. If you're starving, you'll digest before you do anything else because you need the food. So you need a master controller or a regulator uh, or a scheduler to prioritize the different components, not only to tell them what to do and when to do it and to receive the information back from them, but you also need that type of um, prioritization from the signals that you get back because they're dumb. They just, they just do their one function. That's it. Y your eyes don't decide whether or not you see something. Your brain interprets what your eyes are projecting back to it, and it builds a model for the world around you afterwards. The, the eyes just say, caught a photon, caught a photon, caught a photon. That's all they do. And computers work very similarly like that. And the neural networks we build are going to be structured around those same types of principles, which is sort of why I'm getting to all of this. Because building a neural network model on architecture built like this is being constructed abstractly in the same way as a brain would function, which is part of the reason why we call them neural networks is because we're transferring uh, input outputs from nodes based on a weight calculation, which is our matrix operations. Um, but in addition to that, we've got the controller that's compositing everything afterwards and then deciding what to do with the information that's fed into it. And not only does our brain work like that and our hardware work like that, but our code and our models abstractly will likely also have to work like that in order for them to be efficient and reusable. And the reason why we want them to be efficient and reusable, obviously, is because that's what makes these problems tractable. They would be intractable otherwise, and uh, it would be impossible to run through these types of simulations like um, fluid dynamics like we talked before, because mapping out the actual projections of each one of these molecules interacting like in a fluid flow of water or gases um, would be physically impossible, and it's unnecessary because the, the larger motion of the greater system and the dynamics of those systems don't actually hinge upon any individual molecules. It hinges on the dynamics, uh, the viscosity or the, the properties or the, the energy states of the, the mass of the collection of these um, molecules together. So you can kind of from scale abstract away a lot of the detailed complexity like quantum mechanics in physical reality or um, in classical mechanical systems you don't actually need to know the spin of an electron to know the dynamics of a baseball coming off of a bat uh, to calculate m force equals mass times acceleration right so what we're getting at is the um, the structure is going to be very similar and the way nature optimizes its functions in physical interactions from quantum mechanical levels all the way up to classical mechanical levels and, and cosmological scales even, uh, Einsteinian physics in other words, we're going to be applying those same similar principles, which is the reason why I'm going to be using Blender to process my neural networks is because Blender has built into it, um, it's got light simulations for all of its ray tracing uh, functions. It's got uh, physics simulations for things like fluid flows, and those are already pre-optimized with the best algorithms we kind of already know and have implemented on hardware, uh, and as well as um, 
like from hardware meaning the gpus tpus cpus like no matter what we throw at it blender is in the business of making that work as efficiently as possible so i'm trying to exploit those optimizations and repurpose them for my purposes so i don't have to reinvent the wheel in that way but we also get the added benefit of being able to render out efficiently i might add um, visualizations of the data that we're processing through these repurposed uh, color channels, reflection maps, texture maps, um, geometry nodes, and things like that. And that's sort of the benefit to doing all that. So I'll speed ahead a little bit quicker, but the most important thing was just understanding, um, first of all, that you don't need the highest rated, highest performance, most expensive equipment to run these neural networks. What's most important is something that efficiently handles concurrency. So that's number one. Uh, the second is the uh, the lanes and the channels and the, and the PCI lanes, because knowing how your code is being processed in your hardware is going to tell you whether or not it's uh, going to be quicker to implement it one way or another. That's the second thing. Uh, the other thing is when we have a GPU plugged in and we have tons of memory mapped up, we don't want to run out of memory because this is many, many times faster than running off of a, a hard drive. Um, but the other thing from the CPU and your dedicated processing units and your memory uh, that you're going to be feeding all your data through, uh, the only other thing that's really going to be necessary to understand as far as a uh, from a hardware perspective goes is uh, cache. And cache falls similarly, uh, similarly in the same vein as RAM. Um, I guess I'll, I'll cover RAM quickly, I guess, because like there's a lot of misinformation in the RAM world too, where like, first of all, they, they've been talking about the, uh, the clock speeds of RAM because th there's timing obviously that needs to go into reads and writes of volatile memory. So, um, We'll get into that too. Okay, volatile memory means that when the power is shut off, it loses all its data. Uh, that may sound horrible and useless, but the reason why it does that is because that's that's the fastest way. Sorry about that. <clears throat> the reason why it does that is because that's the fastest way to not degrade your equipment uh, is to use capacitors to store values instead of using. Uh, like magnetic charges or flash or anything like that to to store data. So reads and writes on hard drives will eventually wear the hard drives, um, but with RAM it'll it'll outlive most of all of your other components because of the physical way it's built. But the downside to it is uh, RAM, if you lose power, completely wipes out and uh, <clears throat> having your hard drive clear every time you turn your computer off would obviously not be very helpful. But the benefit to it is it's exceptionally fast. So if you have a ton of RAM and a ton of data to process, uh, running out of RAM means that you can't finish processing your, your, your project, which obviously would be devastating. So uh, the clock speeds in RAM matter because if... Uh, if you can fit a bunch of instructions on the CPU cache, like the built-in, uh, where did I have that? On here. So let's say these are my cores. Ugh. Come on. Oh. That's why. Okay, so let's say these are my cores here, and I've got, what, four? Okay, I've got four cores. These cores can all share one big set of built-in memory. I mean, they actually have several la levels to it, but like this is just for, for examples anyway. And each level has more, more, more storage capacity, but they're slightly slower. But this is exceptionally more fast, uh, much faster to go from your core directly to your cache, as we're doing here. This is ex like exceedingly faster than going from your CPU to your memory slot which is, and this is much, much, much faster than going from your CPU out to a SATA controller on way down there or onto an external drive is much, much slower than that even. So the 
Ooh. So the point of this is, if this is your CPU, and your RAM is over here, right? It's much faster for the core to go from here to here and back again than it is for your core to go from here to here and then, you know, through your motherboard and into here. And it's much faster for it to do this, even through RAM, than it is for it to go from a core out to a component, right? And then onto an SSD, which is like a, a solid state storage drive. Um, solid state storage drives have no moving parts, so they're very, very quick too. But there are also HDDs, which are mechanical storage drives, and these things have like spinning platters. Uh, I can't draw, but you know what I mean. So to go from here to here is much, much faster by about, I don't know, three or four times, 3.5 times. Uh, this is about, uh, I'm guessing about 20 times faster than this. This one's faster than this. But this cache here, this is like probably even more, but I'll just say it's like 1500 times faster than this because th this cache only holds like kilobytes, like tiny, tiny amounts, but it'll, it'll store instructions and individual values and like uh, variables and stuff in your code. If you can get your code to stick in your cache and not have to go back and forth to your RAM, you can make even inefficient code highly, highly optimized just based on the hardware, uh, the use of your hardware, as opposed to the use of your fancy components, like having really fast NVMe SSDs or really overclocked RAM or a really fast CPU. If you can just fit your instructions in cache, it almost doesn't even matter what your clock cycles are because instead of waiting 300 clock cycles for it to come back from, or 40 clock cycles to come back from RAM or uh, 3000 clock cycles to come back from an SSD, you can get your information back in like three clock cycles from, from your, your, your cache. So e even if you had a really slow CPU, um, if you can store most of your operations in cache just based on the way you write code, then you can process a ton more information because your CPU is not sitting there idle waiting for information to come back. And this is really important to note because that means that the programming languages we choose and the software we choose matter. And they matter almost as much as the hardware we get to run our computer code on. So that's why most of these implementations for libraries that we're going to be using, like TensorFlow and NumPy and stuff, yeah, they're going to be written in Python, but the underlying libraries that we're using, it's not just for a point of convenience, which they are very, very convenient, and they reduce the complexity a ton because they make it accessible to num numbskulls like me. But uh, it also means that you get to run C and C++ code uh, written by some of the best engineers ever, which is highly efficient and runs directly on your CPUs in in um, in machine code. It's not Python's an interpreted language, JavaScript's an interpreted language. They require software to go through software to go through software. But C and C++ basically are as low level as you can get without going into machine code or assembly language. So these are languages and libraries that will run so efficiently that they can run directly. A lot of their operations, not all of them, can run directly in this cache. C A C H E. C A C H E. And this is our goal. We want as much as possible to be running inside of our cache. Okay, so that that's the main point that I wanted to get to with all of that is um it's important to have excellent processing and all that, but more important than anything else is going to be to to have uh, to have the libraries running on a programming language that's built for hardware interconnecting. Um, that's going to be the most important. Uh, 
I'll do another video kind of separately as a as an addendum part two, and we'll cover all of this in in more detail uh, in case anybody needs it. But I don't think most people will. But um, just for the purposes of being thorough and understanding the hardware that I'm going to be using, because again, this uh, these videos are for documentation purposes and posterity. So I'm going to go over the hardware that I'll be using uh, throughout this this project and uh yeah and then from that I'll, I'll also cover more of the details of the like the uh the use cases how i'm going to be applying the hardware to this project and how that's going to relate to running the models through uh graphics renderers like um, blender or physics simulators uh, and like game engines and things like that not just for lighting and force fields and thing, but also for like vortex simulations and um, light bounces, refraction, reflection, like you know Fresnel gradients and just repurposing any type of physical structures we can find in reality to apply to activation functions, weight functions, um, hopefully some some cost reward functions that help train models in, in supervised settings uh, might be helpful too. Um, we'll also have, what, you, you get like weight forces, like actual like gravity, that type of weight. So we could use edge conditions and boundaries and um, what am I trying to think? Collision detection was the other one. Uh, so if you combine things like collision detection with forces and gravity, you can picture like a ball rolling down a hill with a breeze, a side wind or whatever, kind of pushing it over. And that'll sort of give you a, a visual representation or... Um, It'll let you, you better imagine what I'm talking about by having interacting dynamic systems. So you can have uh, complex flows, like fluid flows that aren't entirely uniform, applying to a physical object with uh, collision detection, which is in motion, which is a function of time, which is also um, on a convex plane or within a manifold or something like that, which is the surface area that it's rolling on. So that's part of the collision, but it's also part of like the gravitational force because things don't fall straight down through a ramp. Uh, if you remember high school physics class, it's uh, like part of that gravitational force gets translated into forward momentum. And then you've got carried momentum forward from that, but then you've also got the ray traces and the light refraction, diffusion, uh, reflections, transmission, black body radiation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we're going to take all of these physical properties and elements of material reality and repurpose them into complex dynamic systems and interactions between co uh, complex dynamic systems to reappropri uh, reappropriate those optimizations toward another purpose uh, for this model. So that that's part one of hardware and, and part two in the architecture video here, I'm going to cover the rest of um, just the, the, the hardware that I'll be using, as I said, but also um, options moving forward with as far as like cloud computing and you know, resource management from the 2020s, the 21st century, where not everything has to be done on a big mainframe. You can actually uh, Distributive computing, that's what I was thinking of. We can distribute the workload after we've got the prototype up and running and a proof of concept, then we can offload all of that onto a network of other computers to run the processing for us. And the benefit to that, especially with this type of research, is obviously that um, we can build models knowing they work and then once it's proven that they work, you can get volunteers to offer time from their computers and we can set up an app or anything like that where um, you can just have this stuff running in the background and it gets to it when it gets to it. And if that sounds a bit hokey or high in the sky, um, I might refer you to uh, some of the space projects because that's exactly how we're mapping out new stars and planets is we're getting people to donate computing resources from their computers when they're not using them, when they're sitting idle. Um, and any one of you, I, I highly encourage you to do it. You can volunteer your computer whenever you'd like to, uh, to help scientific research in cosmology, especially, but also with, um, molecular dynamics, with, uh, protein folding 
and you can help scientific research in that regard too because computers simulating the sh the the folding of proteins it takes an enormous amount of compute power but the more people who contribute to those types of projects the closer we'll get to um uh like medical achievements, like n not just new drugs and things like that, but also discovering the causes or potential causes, uh, potential cures for diseases that are both known and unknown. So a lot of uh, cancer research, for example, is being applied in this way and trying to find um, ways to reshape the structure of the scaffolding of DNA and, and uh, cellular structures too because it's the shape and the physical structure of the molecules that um, ultimately affect and determine the outcomes and the symptoms of conditions and the proliferation or abatement of those conditions too. So understanding protein folding and molecular biology is hugely important for like the, the progress of the species, not, not simply just for, for mere interest. So contributing to projects like that, when you, you know, if you got your computer on at home anyway, um, and you're not using it while you're at work, you can leave it on and be contributing to scientific discoveries around the world. And that's one of the most fantastic things about uh, distributive computing is that the hardware that already exists that's being underutilized can then be put to better use. And projects like these, where we've got neural networks and um, developing generalized artificial intelligence for th that will benefit mankind in so many ways from um, fact-checking politics to uh, traffic signals and autonomous driving, like everything in between, uh, supply chains, resource management, clean water, you name it. So those types of things would dr dramatically benefit the species as a whole. And if we've already got the hardware sitting idle and not using it, having a project like this that's uh, with a proof of concept that works, distributive computing is a viable option for um, free academic progress, basically. Because if you're not using your computer and you're not the one doing the research, you can still participate in the research without even trying, you just get up and walk away. So um, I really want to encourage that type of participation because I think it's unrealistic to have everybody expected to, to be involved in every project that mankind is in. But with the advent of computing and the internet, um, it's possible now to contribute to those types of projects without the expertise. And I think we should all encourage each other to do that because it's just... Uh, is wasteful not to technically we might as well <clears throat> uh, other than you know obviously the the power requirements that it takes to to run all this processing but uh, yeah I think that's that's probably sufficient for now and uh, I'll I'll be back with part two to cover the rest of our architecture program thank you <laughs>